Welcome to Sirda, the weekly podcast produced by VEC Foundation. My name is Karen Sarkisov. I'm curator and editor at VEC. And joining me today are the Hong Kong philosopher and media theorist Yuk Hui and a Russian philosopher, sociologist and prominent political commentator Alexander Dugin. Hello, Yuk. Hello, Alexander. Hi. Hi. And thank you for taking the time for participating in our today's conversation. The occasion for it is provided by the fact that VEC has, has just published the Russian translation of uh, Yuk's recent book called Recursivity and Contingency. And this work is an amazing sweeping genealogy of cybernetics from its earlier anticipations in German idealism to 20th century system theory and beyond. Um, and where recursivity is understood as the looping movement of returning to itself in order to determine itself and contingency as some new information that makes each new loop unique. But more generally, I think that the problem that Yukoi has been wrestling with in this and his previous books as well, including the one which is called The Question of Technology in China, this problem is the reconcilability of modern technology and tradition. And uh, this antagonism marks our time, and on one hand, it's prompted a relapse into traditionalism, sometimes fueling nationalist sentiment, which concerningly has been on the rise over the last decade in Europe and elsewhere. But on the other hand, it has also led to a unilateral technological worldview, which understands technology as a means of conquering or colonizing nature, and which ultimately ushered in the era of climate emergency we're living in right now. And I think that philosophical project of Yukoi could be described as a singular attempt, if not to resolve or sublate this contradiction, at least uh, to stay with it, to dwell on it, to try to wring something meaningful out of it, and his concept of cosmotechnics is the result of this attempt. Now, the idea to have a discussion between Yuk and Alexander Dugin has long been envisioned and planned, and we finally decided to make it happen, not least because Yuk references Alexander's work and critically engages, polemicizes with it in some of his books and articles, and in many ways it may seem as though you have both arrived at a similar diagnosis of the present moment, but you drastically differ in your conclusions. So I'd like to discuss this duality of technology and tradition, at some length today, and I would also suggest by way of principle that we have this pair of recursivity and contingency as two guiding metaphors whereby each new reply or comment helps us resituate or clarify this tension between technology and tradition, if you're okay with that. And to start off, let's maybe turn to Heidegger and his critique of technology, since you both use Heidegger as a departing point in your respective projects and in his writings, Heidegger reveals himself as a techno-pessimist, essentially. He criticizes technology on the grounds that it fosters an extremely instrumental understanding of the world. And to quote him, technology is a power which man himself does not control. The concept he introduces to describe technology is in framing, or gestell in German. And could you please talk about what you make of this criticism and what lessons you draw from it for your own work. I think if you, Alexander, are okay with going first, please do. Thank you. I think that the problem of technology, it is not technical problem. So the main error, main mistake made by the people is to reduce the problem of technology to some technological question. So I am following Heidegger, accepting that the techniques is a metaphysical problem. So it is about the time, the history, the identity, the change, and that universality and locality. So everything is inside, is included in the problem of techniques. I, with great interest, I have uh, read the book of Yu Kuei about cosmotechnics. And I would say that I'm very pleased to discover he's very correct, as long as I could say, his absolutely correct analysis of the relations between the technology and Chinese identity. So that is, I think, that's 
the main thing. So, and but Heidegger could be the starting point. But the problem, I think, uh, there are some limits with Heidegger because he was a kind, as all, every every uh, Western man and thinker is racist. So Heidegger was, as all other Western people, totally and deeply racist. What I mean by, and I'm not, I'm against racism. So what I mean saying racist, that to be racist, it to identify your own culture with the, some universal values. So if I agree with the scholar school, with uh, the school of Weberius de Castro, a new anthropology about multinaturalism, not only multicultural, but multinaturalism. So in my opinion, we are living not in one universal nature, as was the case for, for Heidegger, with one universal destiny that coincides with Western destiny. So, in my opinion, we are living in a pluralistic nature. We have as many natures as we have cultures, as we have peoples. In that sense, Heidegger is very, very significant for the Western civilization. He is the best, as long as I can understand, best thinker of the West. So, and when he puts the problem of technology, of gestell, of uh, relations between the being and the history, Zeinsgeschichte, uh, he always, and that was logical for the member of uh, NSDAP, he is always inside of these uh, ethnocentrist Western optics that I don't share at all. But when I'm coming to Chinese civilization, or when we are coming to Russian civilization, Eurasian civilization, we are a bit outside of these main terms of thought. We are in completely different contexts. So we could not apply directly Heidegger's vision of the history of the technology of the relation and destiny of the metaphysical thought to our society. And that is why I appreciate very much the ideas of Yu Kui, because he tries to put the problem of technology and the technique inside of the authentic history of Chinese mind, Chinese culture. So technology is not universal problem. Technology and the thought, thinking about technology, and technology itself is linked to the civilization. And that is very important. And in the case of great China civilization, that is much more clearer than in our case, because China has its own relation very deep relation to what is the technology, what is the time, what is the destiny. And the problem happened when that was a kind of colonialism after the opium wars, when the China society, totally sure of itself, has met this challenge of this Western colonization, declared and proposed itself as something universal. That was the encounter or meeting with the technology with Western pretension of universalism. And I didn't understand very well what Mr. Yu Hui has proposed, how to solve this problem, because it seems to me that the, for Chinese society, actually, it is not yet solved. The Chinese society is in the process to think on that. And I could accept that in Russian case, we didn't yet arrive at the point where we should ask this question. How Russian identity uh, relates itself to the universalism, to the technology. Eurasianists and Slavophiles, they, uh, or Leontiev or Danilevsky, they tried to, to raise the question, but that was totally forgotten. And now we're living in the totally colonized Russian society with total colonization of our minds. That uh, has happened, the same has happened more or less after precisely after opium wars. This Westernization, modernization, and colonization of China. And, but China tries to get out, and we were done. So I think that uh, an example of the thought, multinaturalist approach of Mr. Ryu Kuei to the technique and his term, cosmotechnics, is very, very useful concept we need to, to learn, to study more and more. 
But yeah, so thank you very much uh, for support, Karen, for organizing this. And uh, my great pleasure to, to talk to Mr. Dugan because I followed very closely your work and I read your fourth uh, theory um, very carefully and also engaged with uh, some of my writing. So uh, a great pleasure to be able to discuss with you today and especially concerning that we start with the question of Heidegger. The other day I was watching this YouTube video that you made with uh, Mr. von Hermann when you visited him in uh, Freiburg. Because I think this is very closely related uh, to some of the questions that you raised. For example, is there a question of geopolitics in Heidegger? And how is this geopolitical question related to technology? And Heidegger, I must, because Karen said that Heidegger is a kind of techno pessimist, which that is not something I I would uh, agree in, because I think that the question of technology is a fundamental in Heidegger's thinking. Heidegger's reading of Western philosophy is actually from the perspective of technology. That's why he said that cybernetics or modern technology is the end of Western metaphysics or Western philosophy. An end is not the, the end point, but as this word in German also suggests, completion, realization. So technology for him is first of all the realization, modern technology is the realization of Western European thought. Now, this seems to Heidegger as a kind of end point of Western philosophy, but also an opening of geopolitics. Now I refer specifically here to his essay, The End of Philosophy and the Task of Thinking, which was published in 1964, where in which Heidegger says that the end of philosophy has two meanings. First of all, which is realized in cybernetics. Therefore, something, everything, every being become manipulable through modern technology. And the second sense of the end of philosophy for him, it means that the world civilization will have to be based on Western European thought. Now, this is a quote from Heidegger. The end of philosophy means that the world civilization will have to be based on Western European thinking. Why? Because Western European thinking for him is already realized in technology. And it is through what we call globalization, what we call the modernization, that this technology of this Western European thought becomes only present. Like what Mr. Dugin says, that what he called colonization previously. And now the question is, what are, how are we going to look at this question? The relation between technology and tradition, or for example, uh, we can say Russian thought, or Russian tradition, Chinese tradition, Chinese thinking. For me, I found very difficult to articulate this question after the two opium wars in China. Because after the two opium wars, there was this idea, which was very dominant in China at the time, which is to say that let's keep the Chinese thought as the soul, and let's import Western technology as the body. Now, we just use the body and uh, let's keep our soul. This was uh, easily accepted. But this, I think this was all already problematic at this point. And I think Arno Toynbee has one interesting point. In a book where actually I think it was a, a series of lectures he gave and with the BBC in the, in the 19, I forgot when exactly, but maybe in the 1950s on Eastern, Western and Eastern history. And he's, he mentioned one point, and I find it really intriguing. He says that actually in the 16th century, there was already contact between Europe and China and Japan. But Europe was refused for the reason that Europe wanted to export religion and technology. And religion immediately changed their belief, their value, and so on. So they refused. But in the 19th century, Europe decided just to export or mainly export technology, and this was easily accepted. But what happened is that, of course, the tradition of Chinese thought was also marginalized through this process of modernization. So the question is, how are we going to rethink of these questions and re-evaluate re the current process of modernization and geopolitics 
And this is, is also the reason for which I raised, I trying to, I propose the concept of cosmotechnics. Because for me, and I agree with the Heidegger, that ha the question of technology is a fundamental. And if you want to open up a new geopolitics, and maybe later we have the chance to discuss a little bit of Kashmir, um, because I think his, uh, his theory of the Grosshaum has also influenced uh, Mr. Dugan's uh, thought on the, post, uh, on the multipolarity. Um, so I would like to propose to put technology at the center of a new philosophy, of a new thinking of geopolitics. So the question is that how can Chinese or Chinese thinking reinvent itself at this time to make itself relevant? to the question of technology. How is this possible? And I think this is a real challenge. And, you know, uh, Mr. Dugan talk was uh, mentioned about Varelas de Castro, who proposed multinationalism. I met him uh, also in, in, in Brazil last year, and we had a discussion on that. Because in my book, I also criticized him in the way that, you know, instead, we, we shouldn't just start talking about multinationalism. We have to also push this further to think of the multiple cosmotechnics. Because by going back nature, it may not be sufficient to address the question of modernization, which is in the process of happening. That we easily withdraw ourselves to the indigenous culture or certain kind of conservative way of understanding tradition. So this was the starting point, and this was also my engagement with the thought of Heidegger. And for Heidegger, he wanted to ask the other beginning, the other beginning after the, uh, after the end of philosophy, which he called thinking. And on this point, I'm very sympathetic with his project of another beginning. But for me, I, I, I think I also agree with Mr. Dugan that this other beginning is not going back to the Greeks. It's not going back to the, only to the, to the Western European tradition. But rather, we have to open up the question of multiplicity, of, uh, of plurality. And that's why I wanted to go back to the question of technology in China. And also in the fourth uh, political theory, Mr. Dugan also proposed to go back to what he called Russian epistem, uh, because I was only able to read the, Chinese, uh, the, the, the English translation, so what I read is uh, Russian epistem. So I was also very curious you know, how the question of uh, Russian, or how, how could this return to Russian epistem open this question of uh, a multipolarity? Because I spent a lot of time studying those few pages that you have written. And again, you know, I would like to think, say the same thing that I said to Varelas de Castro, that maybe we need also have to uh, put more focus or put more weight on the question of technology, even when we talk about the question of epistem, and also this relation between epistem and technics, but not limited to the Aristotelian concept of epistem and technics. Right, very interesting. I could make some remarks if I dare. So, uh, first of all, I think very interesting, you have raised the question how technology and how multinaturalism relates to the geopolitics. First of all, in my opinion, great gross realm of Carl Schmidt or great big space, that is the kind of border of the nature. So uh, that is uh, something like civilization, how it was interpreted by Huntington. So I believe that there are not only one nature. So we, not only, I, I accept not um, multiculturalism, that everybody is more or less in accordance with that. But I argue following ideas of Boas, of Levi-Strauss, of Beverius de Castro, that there are many natures. So the cultures and natures, they go together. So multipolarity or geopolitics, multipolar geopolitics, is based on the recognition that there are many natures. So there are many techniques. In one civilization, in one big space, in the Western European big space, with its proper time, history, destiny, the thought, and nature as well, with the Western European laws of physics, with Western European objects, there is Heideggerian thought that regards 
the history as accumulation of the alienation, because the technique is the end, not as the goal, it is a collapse. So with the technique, the Western metaphysics lives through its own collapse. It is not a kind of some highest point, it's the lowest point. Uh, point, lowest, the calculation and uh, cybernetics and this idea to put everything inside of material objects of quantity, it is the kind of death of the West and the radical nihilism and technique is the expression of the deep and profound nihilism of the West, according to Heidegger. And that is the destiny, not of the humanity, not of uh, the China or Russia. It is not global epistem. It is the modern Western epistem. And fourth political theory, and my idea of multiplicity of designs, not of universality, but multiplicity of designs, it is an invitation to overcome this concept. So, for example, if it is Western destiny, I agree, nihilism is Western destiny, but it is not Russian destiny. It was imposed on us. It was imposed on you. It was imposed on Indians, on everybody else. That was precisely the growth of this Western great space that imposed itself as something universal, not being that. And they started to impose their culture that was... Uh, enlightenment process, colonization process. Today, they don't dare anymore to impose their unique Western European modern, postmodern liberal culture on everybody. They, they pretend to accept uh, the differences, but they still impose on us their nature, uh, understood as in this Western civilization. That is the problem of techniques. And that, so in my opinion, there is absolutely nothing universal in technique. So all cultures and all natures, all civilizations, they have different approach to the technique, the term, uh, procedure, the practices, everything can and was and should be and you linked to this understanding of nature. In your book, you have described this cosmovision, the vision of the cosmos in the Chinese civilization and how traditional understanding of Chinese, of China, uh, of the techniques was totally based on different epistem and paradigm. So, and that was so, so perfectly described in many, many books and philosophy in Neo-Confucianism, in Taoism, in Buddhism. So that is a great, great heritage, how to think properly in Chinese way, the technique. The problem is when you have met with this power, the brutal force, as Japanese did a little bit earlier than you, and that was the kind of the challenge of this, if your civilization controls or is in accordance with the global cosmic order, how these white colonizers, how they could overcome you, being the, the son, uh, Japanese being the son of uh, Materasu, being the gods, or be uh, the great, the sons of the heaven. That was the problem. The same problem we have encountered with Peter the Great, uh, uh, when we have entered as well in this colonization of minds process. That was, I'm calling that archaeomodernity. Archaeomodernity or the term of Oswald Spengler, pseudomorphosis. Pseudomorphosis of the crystals. So we are living, Chinese, Russians, uh, Japanese, we are living in this archaeomodernity. We still have our own deep identity, deep epistem, but this epistem is totally deranged, totally perverted by this imposition of so-called Western racist universality in a technology, in liberalism, and democracy, in all the so-called values of the Western society imposed on us as something universal. So we could not just, and in your book you have spoken about that, that we could not just say, oh, let us adjust Western technology to the Chinese identity because this technology is is already identity. Technology is Western. There, there is no such thing as mathesis universalis against Cartesius. All mathesis is linked to the culture, to the, to the nature. So we have a mathesis occidentalis, calculus occidentalis, and the technique 
is the cultural poison and natural poison that destroys not only our culture, but destroys our, our nature. So I am totally against Western racism that I see discovered in the technology, because I think that technology is racist. Technology is the pure racism, and when they say it is something universal, so we should have the same one zero model of creating cybernetic, it is the Western radical uh, colonialization. Computer is the Western colonizer. So I think that cybernautic or all postmodernity, all that liberalism, it is not universal at all. It is the continuation of the Western ethnocentrism that tries to be imposed on everybody else. They don't uh, pretend today to put on us their religion or their absence of their religions, but they enter in our society by the techniques. And with the technique, they bring us the deaths, their own deaths, not our deaths. And uh, my conversation with the pupil, disciple of Heidegger, Professor von Hermann, ended precisely with this question. I have said to him, uh, I have discovered that there are many designs, not only one universal design. And Hermann has said, no, Heidegger wouldn't accept that because he believed in universality of design that was Western design. So he was, in that sense, he was universalist and a racist. And that is precisely why we, uh, today we are dealing with the technique as something universal. The concept of universality of the technique is the same as, as universality of the nature. It is unipolarity, geopolitical, geopolitical unipolarity, and the technique is the part of that. So what is, that is so important to come through all this illusion, colonial illusion, colonial suggestion, hypnosis of the West in order to get to our inner epistem. But in, in, only after that we could hope on new beginning. New beginning, mm, it is not something universal. It's up to us, to Chinese, to Russian, to Indian, to Muslim, to African, to Latin America, to find a way to our own new beginning. It is not only just return to the past. It is a kind of leap to the eternity, eternity that was totally destroyed by arrival of the Western modernity. They have uh, lost uh, their own eternity and they pretend that nobody should have any more eternity. They have lost their identity, their uh, recurrency. Uh, I, I don't like too much this, this term, but they, they have lost their identity and they pretend that that is universal destiny. And we should as well lose our identity. So I think we need to resist precisely against that, not accepting, for example, Russian version or Chinese version of imperialism. We need to accept the other, the West, never could understand the other. The other for them was or the same or the worse or, or better, but never the other as other. So they could not understand other as other. And they always are embedded in this identitarist, essentialist idea of, uh, of the other as something like the self, but a kind of shadow of that self. So I think that the same thing with the techniques. We need to imagine Russian technique because now we are using anti-Russian technique, poisonous things. So there is not neutral technique. So uh, if something works, it, uh, that doesn't mean that exists. The problem of being and uh, of functionality or uh, practical use or utilitarian value are totally different things. So why ontological thought is so important and why the problem of technology is central as well for our development, for our future, for our destiny, for Chinese destiny or, or Russian destiny. Just to piggyback of what you just said about multipolarity, and also you mentioned Eduardo Viveiros de Castro and his idea of perspectivism and Amerindian cosmologies. Let's maybe reformulate our initial opposition of tradition and technology and reframe it as diversity versus globalization, as you both seem to be critical of the globalist project but again with different alternatives. Uh, Yuk has advocated for so-called technodiversity, and you, Alexander, propose a concept of multipolarity loosely inspired by the philosophy of Carl Schmitt. 
I would like to ask you, because he also have written extensively about the failure of modern universalism exemplified by uh, globalization, and you is calling for an epistemic shift, a new way of thinking and living that would put an end, so to say, to what he calls a synchronization of the global axis of time. So I was wondering if you, you can explain what that would require. And I also guess that many would argue that even this pandemic, along with many other problems uh, plaguing our time, could be ascribed to globalization having essential inbuilt shortcomings. And last but not least, I wonder if you think that critique of globalization can be divorced from uh, like anti-Western sentiment or different versions of nationalism. So, yeah, Yuk. Of the things that Mr. Dugin has said. So let me try to divide it into several parts. And the first thing, I want to be very careful with the opposition between the universal and the particular, or the universal and the reality. Because I think that this opposition itself is a very much a Western thinking. That means that between the universal and the particular, there is an absolute discontinuity. You're either universal or you are relative or you are particular. And for myself, I prefer to think that the universal and the particular are only dimensions of existence. So, for example, we can say when we talk about technology, we can say technology is the externalization of memory. Technology is the extension of the bodily organs. Now, this is anthropologically universal because in every civilization, so we, do, we find people, uh, we find evidence that people, uh, the primitives, learn how to make fire, they know how to make tools. So there is a certain universal tendency. However, this is not all of the story. The formation of these technologies are greatly influenced and determined also by, for example, cosmology, by the relation between the human and its locality. So I would prefer not going so quickly to make an absolute opposition between the two. And this, we can come back to this, to see how this way of thinking can open up something more. Now the second point is concerning the technology and colonization. Because today, you know, when Western Europe or when the West was able to colonize, it's because of their technology, because of their, their military technology. For example, China was forced to modernize because China was defeated in the Opium Wars. The USA after the Second World War was able to dominate because they dropped the at atomic bomb in Japan. They showed that they had a superpower. And the distribution of military forces of the USA in Asia in Europe, that also maintains the, the geopolitical order. So on the one hand, there is a question of military technology and the advancements of the military technology is the key to the, to the maintenance of the power. And secondly is how technology because technology has been understood as something universal. And therefore, non-Europeans, non-Westerners easily accept technology. And while without understanding that technology embeds already its own ontology and epistemology. So this is why, you know, early on I referred to Arno Tornby, when Tornby says that, well, you know, the, the Far East quickly accept Western technology and thought that they will not affect their culture. But in fact, you know, very quickly, the situation was completely different and far beyond imagination. And there was an article by Henry Kissinger in like 2018, uh, which is called How the Enlightenment Ends. So he was basically claims that how, how Artificial intelligence, machine learning, and advanced technologies ended the Enlightenment. But I think that this is a false argument because I think it's precisely, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning, as Mr. Dugin said, are precisely the continuation of Enlightenment. It's the universal of the Enlightenment. It's the carry the universal that was advocated by the Enlightenment. So the question to response is that, as what Mr. Dugan says, and that wants to conceive a Russian technology, 
because the now you know the technology that Russia is using is anti-Russian, <laughs> and this is this argument can also be applied in many non-European countries, even in China, for example. And now going back to the question of epistem, going back to the question of tradition, allows us to imagine to emphasize such a plurality of technology, such a plurality of thinking, which could allow us to imagine a new geopolitics. Now, Mr. Dugin referred very often to Kashmir, and for me, besides of the normals of the, the Earth, there was also a small article that called it the new normals of the Earth. And this, indeed, towards the end of this article, uh, if I remember correctly, Kashmir basically proposed three possibilities. One is unification, so all the different nations, they will be unified. Or we keep the same status quo, we just continue with the current configuration, Europe, USA, China, and Russia, and so on. Or what he called, we can imagine new normals of the Earth, which is maintained by several blocks. For example, Europe is one block. For example, Far East is one block. But where I think that in this imagination, in the, in the proposal of Karl Schmitt, I think that Schmitt uh, presupposes a homogeneous concept of technology. And for me, this is also a problem of his proposals. Why I'm saying this is that because if you read carefully what Schmitt has been writing, and uh, so for example, of, of the land power to the sea power, you know, the sea power dominated by England. England before the 16th century was a country of settlers. You know, they owned a very primitive economy and so on. Until they went into a maritime mode of existence, they developed the sea power and then the air power, air force. So, Schmitt's geopolitics is also identical and closely related to his genealogy, his history of technology. And however, I think that this concept of technology, as you said before, is a quite homogeneous concept of technology. So even I think if you wanted to propose a new normals of the earth, as Schmidt said, we should go back to the question of multiplicity in a more profound sense, like what we said before, multinationalism, multiple cosmotechnics. Because otherwise, if we just want to maintain this configuration, we need to keep on advancing Western technology. It has no way out, because if you don't want to be defeated, you have to put all your energy, all your budgets in developing in that. You know? So we will never get out if we, we follow this way. So this is, a, for me, very important and very urgent to think to emphasize, maybe I can say, new agenda of technologies in uh, Russia, in China, in everywhere. Interesting point. When we study carefully, the text of new normals of the Earth that I have published uh, 30 years ago in Russia, and I have translated this text, that was precisely, if we uh, go deeper in the ideas of Carl Schmitt, we will discover that he linked the universalism of technology precisely to the maritime form of civilization. Mm -hmm. So there was already the technology as something alienated from the human nature was discovered and imagined by the Talosocracy by the uh, British Empire. So the, the, the technology is Anglo-Saxon in, in its uh, inner uh, driver. And a multipolarity in that sense, that is precisely not only Soviet Union against the West, the East against the West, but that is precisely new situation. It is distribution of heartland, of the non-universalist continental type of civilizations. There is not only one maritime technological nature studied by uh, Newton or uh, Western science, but there are different heartlands, not only Russian, not only one Eurasia. The China is heartland by itself. The India is other, another heartland. The Islamic world is the third heartland. Uh, so that is precisely 
in Schmittian though, there are some relations between the quality of globalization and concrete great space of Anglo-Saxon imperialism. And that coincides and explains uh, globalization, unipolar moment after the fall of the Soviet Union. And that is very important things. And uh, so the multinaturalism, it is continental Eurasian way of, of, of thought. The second thing, you are totally right that in order to establish multipolar worlds, we need to put in the question the problem of technology, because precisely we could not just discard it. We could not say, oh, let us put it aside because we will be colonized immediately, uh, economically, political, military. So we need to, to conserve, to preserve some measure, some, some amount of technological development taken from the West as a kind of poison, of poison of Gestell, we need to take it inside in order to transform that in the, in the something, in the medicine. That is the ride the tiger, Chinese proverb. And, but ride the tiger, it is a very, very dangerous thing because if you take too much poison, you will be killed. You will be destroyed in your identity. If you could not manage the poison. If you take too a small portion of uh, the poison, you will be colonized as uh, China uh, economically and politically after uh, losing these two opium wars. So that is the art, art of managing cosmotechnics. It is the art. As long as I understand, uh, Chinese communist government today is busy Absolutely by that, by measuring every day and every night when the collective mind of Chinese Communist Party is, is uh, awake, is uh, trying to somehow keep the balance, save China, save identity, reinforce identity by the technology, and not let the Facebook, YouTube, uh, and the poisonous aspect of technology to get inside of China. So that the balance, and that is the art of political leadership, I think. And in some way, Putin or Russia, try they try to, to do something like that, uh, developing, for example, military industry, but prohibiting uh, gay marriages or gay pride uh, organization or insisting on conservative values. So uh, that is, but nobody in Russia seriously put on the question technology. So uh, they, they think that orthodox Russian identity is one thing and technology and the power and accumulation of the technical resource is the other. And that is wrong. In your book, you, you have shown that that is wrong. That doesn't work for China. And uh, you need to have uh, this huge amount of political wisdom represented in your actual uh, Chinese uh, government in order to keep that in balance. Checking and balancing every day and every night. So Communist Party doesn't sleep, Chinese Communist Party, trying to solve the problem you have individuated very well in your books. And that, and Russia has illusion, uh, Putin has very deep illusion about universalities or universality of technology. And he tried, nevertheless, to oppose Russian identity and sovereignty and multipolarity against this challenge. So that is the difference. But in some aspect, we are a little better prepared than you. In other aspect, you are better prepared than us. So I, that is why I'm trying to promote Russian-Chinese dialogue on a philosophical level, first of all. Because I think there is nothing like your book uh, written in Russia. Uh, when you uh, speak about the, the cosmotechnics, about this universalism put on the question, you put on the question this universalism of the technology. And that is the key point, I see, key point, that we need to de deconstruct archaeomodernity of our societies, of Russian society, archaeomodernism, because we are partly Chinese and Russian, and partly we are Western, liberal, democratic, universal, progressist, and so on. In that sense, when we uncritically accept this pretend that universalism of the West, we are destroying our own identity. And that is not neutral. We could not just put te technology and identity. They, that is deep contradiction, metaphysical contradiction 
and that. And I think that as well, that is the main problem because uh, we need to understand how little technology is uh, self-evident because taking accepting technology, we're accepting time, temporality, as something universal, obligatory, necessary. But it is not our time. It is under Saxon time because there are many forms of time, of time, many forms. There is Chinese time that is totally different from Russian time. We have our Russian Orthodox way of thinking about time and destiny. It's totally different from Western modernity, from uh, Western Catholicism and so on, and uh, liberalism and atheism. So that is the fight for the meaning of the time. Uh, because the technology, we could not separate from the time, from progress, from some special version of time. So we need to put in the center, as Heidegger has done, the, the question of time. The time and our Russian being, and Chinese being, and uh, being of Chinese identity. So that, because there are as many natures, there are as many times. There is not only one time. And technology is the, the a kind of objectivation of, of the Western Anglo-Saxon colonialism, British time. It is when we are dealing with computer, we are dealing with the special concept of time imposed on us. Just as a side note, I remember you, you said somewhere that techno diversity is not a matter of who builds a better or more uh, perfect algorithm for social credit system or who develops a better. 5G technology, or who is more successful in building its own technological sovereignty. And let's use the example of great Chinese firewall that Mr. Dugan seems to hail. So all this phenomena, all this contest, some kind of like war of different technologies seem to contribute to the monotechnological culture of the present. So that was just a side note. And yeah, please... Uh, Yeah, I think it is, uh, you know, this is actually a difficult and a com complicated question. But of course, I agree completely with you that once we separate uh, identity and technology, it's like reaffirming a kind of dualism, you know, a Cartesian dualism. And this is you know, a fatal mistake that one can have. Uh, there are two difficulties. One is uh, the difficulty to recognize that, or even I can say to relativize, technology to recognize that it is, as I said before, I start by claiming that I prefer not to oppose the universal and the relative as uh, two absolute substance, that there is one discontinuity between them, but rather I prefer to understand them as multiple dimensions of existence itself. And I think this will allow us furthermore to understand or to develop strategies of transforming, of transforming modern technologies. And for me, I think this is also a very critical question for Heidegger, but I don't think that Heidegger himself has, of course, he didn't put it in the same way as I do. As I said before, the one difficulty is how to recognize the multiplicity of technology which is to say to recognize that technology is not universal or this universal is not the one and the only dimension of existence. I visited Russia four times, I think, and I talk about this question of technology and no one agree with me because my audience identified themselves with European culture and I remember my frustration when I was in Russia because no one, no one really see the question of technology because it's not evident. We have to explore it. We have to expose its limit. So this is already one difficulty because if we want to articulate the multiplicity of technology, how can we articulate this? And that's what I was trying to do in my book that you have read. I tried to articulate. Now, the second difficulty is how can we reinvent both modern technology and traditional thinking, which you call epistem, Russian epistem, for example. Now, it's true that, for example, the Communist Party in China, they have blocked Google, they have blocked Facebook. The key question is, by doing so, we allow China to invent something which is not Facebook. 
And when I say it's not Facebook, it doesn't mean that simply duplicate of Facebook and change the name or change the language. But rather some tools which embed different radically different ontologies and epistemologies. So for example, the Chinese may have a different way of understanding collectives, which is not Facebook. Facebook is not collective, for example. So this will demand a new education of technology as well, which is not the case in our universities. Today, our university, the technological education is all about a universal calculative thinking of technology. So this is a long project. This is a big project, a, a long process to be done. And in terms of education, we must introduce a different way of studying technology in engineering, for example. Um, but also have the consciousness that we need to reinvent as what you said, you know, like we take the potion and transform. And how can you transform? You know, we are not just mixing them together without having an idea and then die. What are the methods? What are the approaches? What kind of thinking could be fundamental? And I, for myself, I think that this is the task of philosophy as a new beginning. A new life that we should give it to philosophy. Great, great. Uh, I would like to add some consideration, maybe. I agree absolutely with that. So uh, we need the problem of technology is purely metaphysical and philosophical problem. I think as well we need to, to remember that in Greek, techne, techne means art. Art. There is no other uh, other text. Art. The art. Artist. So if we totally agree, there is. Chinese art, there is Russian art. But when we are coming to the Greek translation of the same word, same word, art, we I say, oh, oh no, there could not be Chinese te techniques or Russian techniques. There could be art, Russian and Chinese, it couldn't be uh, technique. The same, but in Greek, say, say the same broken uh, English. Let's don't say it Russian, don't say in the German, say it in broken English. So uh, if we just change or return to the meaning, original meaning of the Greek word, we see exactly how it could be solved. If the techne means art, so everybody could put the problem you raise in the center. And the second thing, I think that in the history of the Asian thought, and precisely in Indian thought, we have passed already by some metaphysical crisis, very comparable with, the, with that we have now, that was in the Buddhist time. And the early Buddhism was a kind of nihilism, nihilism based on the concept that everything is just representation, that there is no substantial reality, there is no being. And this Buddhism, or uh, early Buddhism of Hinayana Buddhism, was overcome by Mahayana Buddhism, by uh, next um, Buddhism, and that was made mainly in China. So China mm -hmm. Buddhism was reintroduction of the ontological, special Chinese ontology inside of nihilistic early Buddhist tradition, developing Mahayana Buddhism in something totally, totally different from the starting point. So that was introduction of post-nihilist horizon. So I think something like that could happen and should happen with Chinese relation to internet, to artificial relations, uh, and, uh, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence in something like Buddhist concept of Alaya Vijnana. There is, everything is just representation of the mind and there is nothing inside. There is, there is a kind of uh, uh, already, already singularity concept in Buddhist perspective. But Chinese culture has overcome that already by reintroduction, new kind of very special Taoist, I would say, on Confucianist ontology, Tao, reintroducing uh, an introduction of some kind of Tao, of supra-rational principle inside of the being, and that was the cure for Buddhism that was already overcoming of this nihilism historically. So you have already passed by this singularity moment with the expansion of Buddhism, and that was not just re rejection of it. It was 
a kind of accommodation, inclusion into uh, this brilliant uh, Chinese identity, very strong and very open at the same time, very very weak in exterior, but very, very powerful interiorly. So I think that you have, uh, for that, you, you have a kind of tools in your culture. So these relations, and for example, when you have cited in your, in your book the name of the morality, and the morality, the name morality in the treaty of some Confucianists, that was morality is translated Dao De. Morality, Dao De, relation of the first articulation of the metaphysical principle to this principle itself. So that is very particular morality, something completely different from what we understand under morality. So I think, so uh, this return to the revision of the so-called universalist terms of technology and practices and Facebook and so on, in your Chinese culture, you have already some, I would say, dispositif, le, le dispositif, as Michel Foucault said. This, you have Chinese dispositif to solve this problem. Some, somehow, uh, we Russians as well uh, have something that, but our way to, to, to overcome this challenge of nihilism in China and in Russia are different. So Russian epistem is very different from China, but they have something in common. They have nothing to do with the Western concept imposed on our society. So uh, our solutions will be certainly different. But uh, the problem we are facing with is the same, almost exactly the same. So that is precisely multipolarity or multinaturalism or perspectivism, in, because perspectivism is the same as Eurasianism. Eurasianism is multinationalism and perspectivism. And the only thing that, that has nothing to do with nationalism, maybe you didn't, um, you didn't get that from my text or from translations well. So I'm, I, I have nothing of nationalism. I am against all kinds. Nationalism is the Western form of organizing society on the citizenship level. So that is completely against our tradition. So I am against nationalism, against racism, but I am advocating Russian identity, cultural, open, but Russian epistem, precisely Russian nature, Russian technique, Russian art, and that should not be closed. It should be open, but in the some organic, organic borders, not totally. So the relations between universality and particularity should be found. If it could not take, oh, we are universal, or not, we are just a part. The whole, the whole thing and the parts are the problems. That is very, very, the problem of synthetic understanding of the being. So I'm that sense, I'm Aristotelian more than Platonist. So, but uh, I, I think that that's very important that we, as we are speaking about the thing like that. It's very important. It should be brought to the center of the public discussion in our countries. The, te the question of technique and the questioning uh, uh, technology, the problem of cosmotechnic, as you have formulated that, as you have called that. So I, I really enjoy um, this kind of, uh, of conversation. Uh, I would like to to continue that in the future. And my uh, congratulations for publishing your book in our language in Russia. Well, thank you very much. Do you want to reply or should I uh, ask, I think, my final question? Yeah, I just say something very quickly because the question of art is very important, of course, but today what we call contemporary art is uh, a confusion because contemporary art create kind of disorientation. I'm sorry, Karen, because you are in the Institute of Contemporary Arts. But this is the subject of a book that I'm going to publish end of this year called Arts and Cosmotechnics, which is an articulation of what I call the varieties of experience of art. You know, as you can see that it uh, made allusion to the work of William James, uh, the varieties of religious experience. Uh, and fundamentally for Heidegger, the question of art, the question of techne is the question of being, is the unconsumment of being. But of course, the question of being has never been at the center of Chinese thought. You know, for the Kyoto school, for the Japanese philosophers, the Kyoto school believed that the Eastern philosophy starts with the question of nothing. So, there is already a fundamental difference 
experience, fundamental understanding of art and technique. Uh, but that is another question. Uh, but I wanted to, you know, bring back to the question of episteme and my concern of the use of the term episteme in the sense of Michel Foucault, uh, as well as what I understand in my own um, periodization of the question of technology in China, because as you know very well that Michel Foucault, after he used this term episteme, later he abandoned this term in, in some way, but and used the term dispositive, which you, you, you used late before. So I, I appreciate that you bring back the term episteme and give new life to the term episteme. Because of course, the term dispositive is related to apparatus and it is related to gestell, for example. And so there's a, this genealogy in philology, which you can find, for example, in Agamben Foucault's reading of Heidegger. So the question of episteme is, I think, is the fundamental and how also its relation to us, to, to aesthetics, uh, and how do we interpret this. Now, before you mention about Buddhism and so on, and in fact, I think that maybe you can say that in the history of China, there was a three huge crises in the history. The first crisis is the collapse of the Zhou dynasty, and the response to this crisis is the emergence of Confucianism. And so Confucianism wants to restore the right, the rituals, which I think that the translate as a protocol, to restore the protocol. The second crisis is the introduction of Buddhism to China, which basically was a crisis for Confucianism. And so from the 11th century on, Confucianism had tried to fight against Buddhism. And the way they fight is in that they wanted to create a stronger philosophy. Because of Buddhist thinking, has a strong power of explanation. They explain almost everything, which is, was not the case with Confucianism. So in the 11th century, Confucianism wanted to reinvent itself with a new cosmology. Confucianism as a response to the crisis of the Zhou dynasty and Neo-Confucianism response to the crisis brought about by Buddhism. These two responses involve I think, a reinvention of the episteme. One we can find in early, what we call primitive Confucianism, and later in the 11th century, Neo-Confucianism. And there was the third crisis, and this is the biggest one in China, which was the defeat of the Opium Wars, that China was forced to modernize. And before, if Buddhism was still a kind of thinking, a philosophy, but now they have to confront the materiality, military force, machines, constitutions, everything, material. And I think that China is still struggling with this question. So I propose to rethink the question of episteme along this line, and the episteme, which is yet to be articulated, for example, in the context of China, uh, so I was very curious because I wanted to read more about the, your, your concept of the Russian episteme and how you articulate it. But in the fourth political theory, there was not much uh, what I understood was something yet to be further elaborated. Uh, Good answer, uh, sharply. So I have written 24 volumes work recently yeah. that is called No Magia. Mm -hmm. And the last three volumes are dedicated totally to the study of Russian episteme. Three volumes. And a special methodology inside of that, based on the multiplicity of civilizations, multi-perspectivism, and so on. And in these three volumes, I try to restore a kind of intellectual history of Russia and Russian episteme, how it was perverted, how it was separated on two branches, the, the state episteme and the people's episteme, that there is a huge dualism uh, in Russian history. So that is very, very complicated uh, and complex problem, but it is really, really important because it is not easy to grasp what Russian episteme is mm -hmm including for most of Russians. So it demands a special attention, special method, special tool. And I agree that we are, all of us today, Chinese and Russians, we should solve this problem. We are in a deep crisis and we need somehow respond to the challenge 
uh, we have. And uh, I think that we need to overcome this crisis, this nihilism. And in, interesting that in Kyoto school, I was very curious about this mm -hmm. history of Nishitani, of Kitara Nishida, and this Japanese way to try to overcome the modernity. So as well as you, I agree with you, it was a little bit simplistic, I would say. So th their response with uh, the Japanese imperialism was too simplistic. So there, there is, but some of their illumination, some of their uh, way of thinking are very interesting and it's inspiring. But I think that Chinese civilization is much deeper in that sense mm -hmm. and the Japanese were your followers. And, but in that sense, we need to get inside of our civilization in order to find a solution. So Russian epistem is based on this dualism between more or less in the European structure of the state and the Apollonian, Apollonian structure mm -hmm. of the state in Dionysian structure of the society. They are a very, very, very particular dialectic. So there is not only one epistem, there is a, a very dynamic historical relations between the people and the state, sometimes very contradictional, sometimes in the harmony. But I have uh, remarked that the gap between the state and the people always was growing through our history. So the, the people uh, came its way and it was following its dispositive and the state uh, came its own way. So now we are coming to the final conflict, I think, in our history, because we need to rethink what is the people and what is the state and how different they are and how different are their epistems. We have not only one epistem, we have two totally uh, changing to, uh, uh, in the, uh, the process of metamorphosis of both of them. So this is very complicated, very passionate question, but uh, we are obliged to solve that. But nobody, um, almost nobody thinks about the things like that in modern Russia, but everybody better, uh, better should do that, I think. Thank you. Um, and as some kind of summary, I would like to hear maybe your final thoughts about this fantasy of technological singularity promoted by many in Silicon Valley, as we know, and normally associated with the names of Ray Kurzweil, Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, and the like. There's also a tinge of transhumanism there, obviously. And also, I would like you to maybe briefly talk about its fraught and uneasy relationship with the legacy of the Enlightenment as well. So my question would be, like, is singularity our destiny, to use Heideggerian term? Yeah, Who, whoever wants to start first, please. Maybe Alexander? Oh, first of all, I think that there is approaching some event, a ragness, But singularity in Heideggerian vision or in my vision or speculative realism or objective-oriented ontology, it is a kind of the final triumph and the victory of Das Mann in Heidegger. So when we will lose totally and irreversibly design, so the possibility of the return, of the, the possibility of the real freedom for the being, we will be replaced by the system of objects. That is technological singularity and artificial intelligence. So I think that in orthodox vision, that is coming of the Satan, of the Antichrist. So I consider speculative realism as a kind of revelation of the Satan and the clear and silicon value as the temple of the Antichrist, where this uh, final destruction of the humanity is prepared. So for, now that coincides more or less with how Heidegger considered the logical development of the Western civilization, nihilism, and so on, if there will be no return. The return, or a kind of the uh, care in German. So return to the being and return to Zelps of design is possible where there is the human where well, there will be no human anymore, the return to the authenticity will be impossible. So the people who are preparing this singularity, they try to, to, de to, to destroy totally this possibility. It is unused possibility, but artificial intelligence, when it arrives, uh, that will be Dasman, the rule of Dasman, in our eyes, that will be the Antichrist. 
But at the same time, I, I'm very interested by um, speculative realism, precisely because of the clear uh, exposition of what the other uh, shy globalists have in mind. So they are speaking about the hor horror, about the sneak land does, about destruction of the on the earth. And that is the logic of accelerationism, of the capitalism, to destroy not only human, but destroy with the human, destroy the life. And this concept of uh, Fang, the nomina, the, the book of land, is the clear process of acceleration. And that is the logical end and final point of enlightenment, because the speculative realists, they are the children, but the real children of black uh, enlightenment, because enlightenment was black. The, the modernity in the West has brought the black light of the Saturn on the Earth. And they are a very beautiful and uh, open and quite sincere the children of the Saturn uh, speculative realists. The Newton and progressists and liberals as well are, but they are my, and much more shy. So accelerationists or these uh, progressists from Silicon Valley on the partisans of uh, object-oriented ontology uh, or of uh, new Lovecraftian uh, shifts of uh, speculative realism. That is the truth. That is arrival of uh, infracorporal entities, the old ones of Lovecraft. It arrives precisely in time. I consider them to be syndromes of the ending of enlightenment, but not as a catastrophe, but it is realization of all the ideas that were, that was from the, from the start, from the beginning. So that is logical end and a kind of victory of enlightenment. So enlightenment, materialism, was already the way to uh, singularity and the technology and artificial intelligence. I understand that in China perspective, you have not such thing as eschatology, as the end of time. You have different, different temporality. And uh, it is our, I just explain my vision because I'm the part of Christian culture. I have Christian Orthodox consciousness. In, in my opinion, according to this Christian Orthodox episteme, it couldn't be nothing else as mm -hmm. that. So in our perspective, but I, I think that you have totally different uh, system uh, of disposition of the episteme uh, based on totally different uh, understanding of being and nothing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would be very interesting to know what you think, uh, Yukwe, about uh, um, this, uh, this question. Thank you, thank you for the last uh, question. Very interesting singularity because uh, the concept of singularity is based on this belief in that one day we may arrive you know, when, when the computer or the artificial intelligence is able to reflect on itself. And then at the moment, there will be an explosion of intelligence. And this explosion of intelligence will accelerate and exceed greatly all human intelligence. By then, everything could be run by the superintelligence, the state, be run by the superintelligence. In a way, this is a very much a continuation of the Hegelian logic. So that's why in my book, Rika City and Contingency, that Hegel's dialectics has a very important role to play in the understanding of the genealogy of artificial intelligence and also this model of this logic. But the, the way that this singularity is presented I think we should divide it into two different groups. One group is how it is presented as a speculative project, in the sense of speculative realism and so on. And on the other hand, by the entrepreneur of Silicon Valley, that, that of course there's also coincidence, but it seems to me that the way it is presented is a very strange uh, theological concept which is, you cannot say it is antichrist or it is a catacomb. It is a maybe an antichrist in disguise of the catacomb, <laughs> in a way. That because with the realization of the super intelligence, and then we can realize a better world, the self-destruction of capitalism and the machine will be much better than human beings in terms of social, economic, and political planning. 
and like the realization of the ideal states by intelligence. Um, but also, of course, at the same time, it's a state of eschatology, the end, and then the new beginning. That is my understanding how it has been presented as a direct response to the question of Karen. But I think in related to what we have been discussing since more than an hour ago, for me, I think that the singularity has been commonly perceived as an end point, as an end point that all civilizations, all cultures, Russia, China, we are synchronized by this end point towards the singularity. And for me, I think that I'm very speculative, and I like very much speculative philosophy. And my speculation has been, instead of converging and being synchronized to this singularity, is it possible that we reopen it as a multiplicity, as a multiple histories? So this be Russian uh, or Eurasian uh, temporality, Eurasian future, or Chinese future. It seems to me that we need to diverse this convergence, this multiplicity, and this, for me, is even more speculative than speculating it is convergence to one point. So I was, uh, that would be my response to that, and that is also at the core of the argumentation of multiple cosmotechnics, multiple naturalism. Great, great. Uh, uh, just one remark. Uh, I would like to say, to, so uh, we have maybe this duplicity, double double aspect of the final figure of this, this event, it's very important. I agree, it will be not unidimensional uh, element, because in our perspective, the arrival of Antichrist coincides with the arrival of the second coming of the Christ. Yeah. And the concept of Katechon, of Karl Schmidt, or in our tradition, it is a kind of, uh, as well, uh, it has two aspects. It is catechon for the best, and it is catech uh, catechon for the worst. So the catechon doesn't let anything to pass, history to happen. So catechon is uh, that who is obstacle, obstacle to one thing and to the other, negative or positive. So there is, the it is very interesting. And I think that as well, singularity is one thing, and the event, rightness, in Heideggerian sense, is the other. They seem to coincide in our moment of history, but they are two totally different, maybe coinciding temp in the time, but totally different ontologically and eschatologically event. And what you have speak about, as long as I understand, if there is precisely event in the Heideggerian sense, if we could arrive to the point of the diversification, multiplicity of being, that will be the positive event. But what we are coming with artificial intelligence is totally, it is an implosion of the mind, not explosion, an implosion. That is the yeah. idea of some a totally alienated rationality that will rule instead of possibility of return to this multiplicity. This right. totally the new new totalitarianism. So we need to divide that carefully as you do. So I I agree, and we we need to to think about that more and more. Thank you. That's very that was very fruitful. Thank you, Alexander Dugin and Yukoi, for this very stimulating and very compelling debate. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in today and until next Wednesday, I guess. Thank you. Best wishes. Thank you very much. Thank you.